I'm given the difficult task of introducing the three most special people in this room to us, uh, without which neither Ravi, me, nor any of the Umeed mental health team would be in the journey that they are in today. So Peggy, Maggie, Shona, from the bottom of our hearts, from the entire team, thank you. It's hard to introduce the energy in the room. It's even harder to introduce a person who's more than the energy in the room. <laughs> Peggy uh, is the founder of Reauthoring Teaching, Vermont. Reauthoring Teaching is a not-for-profit organization that promotes training and professional development in a narrative approach to therapy, organizational, and community work. A practitioner in therapeutic conversations, a teacher, as well as a consultant, Peggy has also started her own online study group, which she calls the Collab Salon. She has over 35 years of experience in early intervention, family therapy, and mental health, and has written and co-authored several books. It is an absolute pleasure to have Peggy with us, who is now more than a colleague and a friend. The image I have of her and a lot of people who were of the batch of MSTP4 uh, know her standing on the chair <laughs> and feeling as if she's up on the mountain and teaching us the skills of risk story development and she will say it's getting risk story and it's really ingrained at the image of you Maggie. Maggie Carey is the co-director of NP Australia. She has been involved with narrative therapy since the early 90s and has been teaching it over 18 years in local and international contexts. Lively, energetic, and passionate, Maggie ensures that practitioners develop their own rich accounts of themselves and their work. Currently, Maggie works with a wide spectrum of issues that impact people's life and also has supervision practice, practice with practice, practitioners from across the globe. It is an honor to have Maggie here with us at the Room Full of Stories. Uh, we, we fought over you, Shona, so <laughs> we're, we're not quite sure who won the <laughs> argument, so. So, uh, I think the image I have about Shona is that she will always let, uh, if you ask questions and if you're really thinking through teaching, she'll say, can we hold on to this thought? <laughs> can we really hold on to this thought and think about it? And I think that has influenced me and a lot of us to think about the language, the work, and how it influences us. In, in the way we think. Uh, Shona is also the co-director of NPA Australia. She works in a wide range of therapeutic contexts, working with individuals, families, and communities. She also supervises practitioners who work in the space of trauma, violence, and abuse. Dynamic and passionate, Shona enjoys teaching both locally and internationally. Shona, it is a pleasure to have you here with us today at the Room Full of Stories. Today at a room full of stories, Peggy, Shona, and Maggie will give us an overview of the history of narrative therapy and locate some of the areas of study that have informed this approach. They will also reflect on ways in which working with Umid has, the Umid team has contributed to their own work and how it continues to shape and inform their ways of working. They will look at ways in which, to, in which identity is seen as co-construction in narrative therapy rather than a fixed reality. Welcome and thank you again. And uh, as a lot of dreams are coming through for me, uh, this is uh, one of the most, <laughs> I think uh, this is the first time in history that you three of, three of you are mm -hmm. talking together. Uh, each time we have seen you, we've seen you in block coming across the year, but we have never seen you together teaching. So yeah. it's, it's a privilege <laughs> for us to have you here. Yeah, it's as special for the UMI team to have three of you all together. Thank you so much. Uh, hello and, and welcome everybody um, and thank you so much for such a warm introduction. Uh, my heart is full, Maggie's <laughs> heart is full, Peggy's heart is full. I'm sure all your hearts are full after such an incredible day of stories um, and also full of the passion and the skills that everyone who has presented today has shared. We are incredibly honoured to be here and to be here together is very special and we'd really like to thank Umid 
the partnership that, that we have with you is nothing but joyous and um, it's, it really is an honour to be with you today. Uh, the topic past, present and future possibilities came to us in conversation when we were trying to imagine what we could share and we're each going to share something that we feel passionate about and we'll, we're each just going to say a word about that. Um, mine starts with a story. Um, Maggie and I both were born and we live in Adelaide, right down under on the very south coast of South Australia and it happens to be the city where Michael White was born and grew up. So we've been very fortunate to be involved um, and connected to the history of narrative therapy to watch it in many forms for a long period of time. It's some, the history is something that I feel really passionate about. So even though uh, you're full of powerful rich stories and your hearts are probably bursting, I'm hoping to put a bit of a frame around that by sharing some of the history with you this afternoon. Uh, and for me, um, uh, I'm really wanting to, to continue a, a tradition that uh, has always um, been part of a, of a gathering like this, to, to draw some, some of these theoretical frames around our experience. and. Uh, and, and to look at some of the, some of the links with some, some of the present, I guess, uh, developments in, in the field of, uh, of, the, of, of humanity, social services, um, the field of critical thinking, uh, philosophy, uh, to draw some links uh, with the, with, within that tradition of, uh, that Michael always had of, of drawing things from, from other from other areas and bodies of knowledge and to make links with, with our experience. So, so we are going to offer you a, a calmer space than some of the uh, um, other presentations. <coughs> We're going to, to make uh, some of these, the, as Shona says, this theoretical frame. And I have the treat of following Shona and um, Maggie and building on some of what they say with this theoretical frame, and then in particular uh, looking toward UMEED and the mental health uh, training program as an illustration of what we want to express and in some ways to uh, hope to convey some of the impact that working with them has had on us. And then at the very end, we're going to add to a little special something. <laughs> history matters. We are really enthusiastic about the history of narrative therapy and community work as this history creates a foundation for the work in the present that we've heard so beautifully shared today and beyond. Recently, as I was trawling through the hidden treasures within my library of narrative therapy books and papers, I came across an article I knew little about. And it didn't take long to discover that this article came from the first presentation that Michael White and David Epstein made together in 1985 in Melbourne, Australia. That's over 30 years ago. I was so excited by what I read that I wrote to David asking his thoughts on the paper. As is his habit, he replied and he said, Shona, it's often important to look back in order to go forward. Today, at this first narrative therapy conference in India, I'd like to paint a brief picture that takes us back to explore the history of narrative therapy and to invite you to consider the, the implications of this for your work and teaching. Looking back at this history will, I hope, identify some of the historical conditions of narrative therapy as it has developed in the context of Australia, New Zealand, the United States and further beyond. It's a history that holds relevance as we move forward in our work and in the ongoing development of narrative practices. Now you'll realise that if we go back to 1985, narrative therapy and community work is not new. It has it, its origins 
through vital collaborations between David and Michael in the early 1980s across the seas between South Australia and New Zealand. At that time, Michael was editor of the Australian Journal of Family Therapy, which was a vehicle for sharing, debating and exploring new ways of working. And there were many lively debates going on in Australia at that time. You had the opportunity to meet David yesterday and we'd really like for you, those of you who haven't had the opportunity, to... Ravi, can you help me with the... This, please. Thank you. Which one did you press? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we'd really like to have the opportunity to bring Michael's presence into the room today. The context with which he and David began to develop what has become known as narrative therapy was powerfully shaped by a range of considerations and we have chosen a few of these themes to share. The narrative metaphor was introduced in Australia and New Zealand and the United States in the late 1980s at a time when family therapy in the West was shaped by metaphors of structure or metaphors of systems, or metaphors of strategy. Michael and David built on this early work in family therapy by engaging with the narrative metaphor as an organising frame for their work. Their interest, which grew from their work with families, initially in medical settings, offered a new and very different approach. The first paper they wrote together, and the one that I discovered not so long ago, Consulting Your Consultants, the, the documentation of alternative knowledges, elaborated a radical shift in positioning. At the time when the authority of defining and interpreting problems lay with the therapist, their work highlighted a significant shift and it turned the status quo of therapy on its head. White and Epstein discussed an approach which assumed that persons had thoughts and ideas relevant to their own lives. We've heard lots about that this, these two days. In the form of alternative knowledge to the problem and that these ideas could form creative, insightful and relevant solutions to the problems at hand. When persons are established as consultants to themselves, to others and to the therapist, they experience themselves as more of an authority on their own lives, their problems and the solutions to these problems. This authority takes the form of a kind of knowledge and expertise which is recorded in a popular medium so that it is accessible to the consultant, to the therapist and potential others. So therapists became co-authors or co-researchers and people began to connect with their capacity to make a difference in their lives and relationships. Michael wrote, this approach actively engages persons in unravelling mysteries that the therapist can't solve. Such forms of alternative knowledge can only be found through careful and rigorous consultation with the family, not through instruction or advice, but through a position of inquiry. I shouldn't be surprised, but I find the prescience of the position that Michael and David took over 30 years ago and which heralded a seismic shift in the direction of therapeutic work gives us some insight to the enormous contribution their work has made to our lives. It's well known that both Michael and David had a thirst for reading widely and that their creative engagement with a diversity of authors across disciplines has a major influence on the shape of narrative therapy. The practice always came first. The work with families and communities was always at the forefront before theory. But then theory offered new possibilities and opportunities for practice. Many people have said to us that one of the most significant contributions Michael made, and I've, it's true of David as well, was to read broadly and to make links between what they read and therapeutic practice. This critical engagement with anthropology, literary theory, philosophy, 
and more opened up new opportunities and, direct and directions for practice. Tracing the history of their fertile engagement with authors beyond psychology and across disciplines highlights the ways Michael and David innovated and expanded on ideas. The links they made are too numerous to mention here, but for those of you who are interested, there are rich discoveries to be made, and these are well documented in the li literature. Yesterday, after David Epstein's keynote, I was listening in on a discussion between Johansib and da Daisy, who were talking about influential Indian philosophies, and I'm eager to hear more on this. Today, as Vibha and Vijay spoke about elevating the chapati, <laughs> I got the impression we have a lot to look forward to in hearing more from Indian philosophers and thinkers. Narrative therapy is not a model. Rather, it has been developed through a rigorous and ongoing engagement with lived experience, influential theorists and emerging therapeutic practices. These therapeutic practices continue to be responsive to the worlds we live in, to the social and historical context of particular communities. Through our work with Narrative Practices Adelaide, we've been incredibly fortunate to travel and learn from colleagues in other countries and cultures about the histories of thought and identity that make sense in their context. It's very significant for us to share emerging work that takes account of the history of narrative work and is responsive in diverse contexts. For example, our colleagues really seek engagement with theorists that take stock of the political history in that country. Our colleagues from Colectivo in Mexico are drawn to the French Caribbean writer and philosopher Edouard Glissant, who in Poetics of Relation writes about identity in a fresh way. And it has been inspiring for us these last two days to hear from the Omid team and the, the enlivening way many workers, including the community presentations we've heard today, are taking the work forward in India. These therapeutic practices continue to be responsive to the worlds we live in, to the cultural practices of particular communities and to the challenges we face in responding to issues of inequity and injustice. The paper Deconstruction and Therapy became well known in 1991 at a time when Michael was clearly outlining the politics of his work and there was international interest in this. The clear influence of the work of the French historian Michel Foucault was highlighted at that time, as was the work of others, in articula articulating the move towards what was called a deconstructive method. Central to the development of narrative therapy was the deconstruction of stories people lived by and the objectification of the problem as distinct from the objectification of persons. The deconstruction being looked at took different forms. For example, the deconstruction of self-narrative and the dominant cultural knowledges that persons live by, the deconstruction of practices of self and of relationship, and the deconstruction of the discursive practices of our culture. Michael and David were developing a counter-language or an anti-language, giving prominence to different forms of knowledge. Knowledge about people's ability to resist the problem's influence and to develop their preferences, hopes and abilities, as we've heard so much today. Such stories could only come to light through an acute form of listening and from careful, rigorous inquiry, which has become the hallmark of narrative practice. During the late 1960s and early 70s, the social sciences went through an interpretive turn. This turn radically altered the shape of inquiry from approaches that centred on the concept of a truth, a knowable truth, or a fixed notion of who we are, to approaches that viewed meaning as a central focus. The focus of inquiry turned toward the significance of meanings that people gave to their experiences of life 
and it came from the view that people are meaning makers. Through the interpretive turn, social sciences couldn't get away with interpreting other cultures. Instead, the gaze was turned back on our own cultures to investigate practices that impacted on identity and had been taken for granted. From the outset, the practices of narrative therapy have not stood alone. Michael located many of his explorations within this interpretive turn, which opened rich avenues of inquiry and are in sharp contrast to the predominantly held understandings of self and identity as internal constructs. In Australia, as elsewhere, the indefatigable work of women has shed light on gender-based structural in inequities within society and on the impact of domestic violence and sexual abuse on the lives of women and children. Again, stories of which we've heard in the work shared today. In 1984, an Australian therapist named Kerry James presented a defining plenary at the Australian Family Therapy Conference titled Breaking the Chains of Gender which focus on issues of gender inequity in family therapy and their relevance to our work as clinicians. Michael White made it clear to us that narrative therapy is not neutral and that as health workers we have a responsibility to address issues of inequity and how these are experienced and expressed in relationships. In this way, the therapy itself is about issues of equity and fairness how these issues can be raised and addressed and how people can make changes. Currently, there is an important worldwide focus on making space for the often unexpressed and unspoken experiences of lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual and intersex persons. Since the 1980s, narrative therapy in Australia has been and continues to be shaped by the knowledge and experience of the first Australians referred to as Aboriginal people. The problems experienced by Aboriginal people in their first lives are over in their personal lives are overwhelmingly due to the context of oppression and injustice within which they live and the systematic destruction and denial of their stories their knowledges and abilities. Narrative therapy recognises the way in which dominant culture imposes stories on people that rob them of their history and their preferred ways of being. It acknowledges the importance of naming injustice and exploitation in people's lives and the crucial importance of supporting communities in reclaiming preferred ways of being. <coughs> <coughs> 